All right, today in my master class, <clears throat> whoa, I'm gonna talk about doing your job. Muscles, like other systems in the body, have jobs to do. And uh, you can think about it collectively, like um, uh, the cardiovascular system. The system has a job to do, but then you have like veins and arteries and the heart that have specific jobs to do within that whole system. And so that's how I want you to think about the musculoskeletal system, specifically muscles today, is that why do we have them? And we have them to do a job, the system itself, but then you have individual parts of the system, like the bicep, the tricep, the deltoids, the pecs, right? So you have different muscles and they do jobs. And what are their jobs? They are internal forces. Forces in general, whether you're talking about gravity, friction, or influencers of motion. That's all forces are. Forces are influencers of motion. So you think of uh, cause and effect, right? If you see something move, there had to be an influencer there to move it. In the case of muscles, we can't just think of muscles as movers. We have to think of muscles in other ways, too. Uh, they prevent motion, like I talked about last lecture with the elevator cable, right? So muscles can move you. Muscles can speed you up. Muscles can slow you down. Muscles can stop you from moving. But the key thing is all of that comes down to motion. Influencers of your motion. Okay, so let's remember that's why we have them to influence motion. And our muscles in our body influence motion uh, like last lecture in three main ways, right? They can, uh, they can shorten while trying to shorten no change while trying to shorten, be lengthened while trying to shorten. But that's why we have them. So piggybacking from last lecture, if you have a specific job you need to do, you call, you make a call, you make a call to the person who's gonna do that job. Let's, let's just give you an example here. If my head wants to stay um, upright, okay? Gravity, inside gravity, there's more stuff in the front of my neck than in the back, like a teeter-totter, right? If you have a teeter-totter, let's say I have a, a mini teeter-totter right here, okay? My pin is my teeter-totter. And if I had more stuff on one side, gravity would make the teeter-totter move. Right? In the case of the neck, on here, I got a lot more stuff on this side. And gravity wants to make the teeter-totter do this. We call that motion flexion. So if I'm upright, gravity is trying to flex me. Gravity is a force. It is an influencer of motion. So if gravity is trying to flex my cervical vertebra, how am I going to keep my cervical vertebra from flexing? I'm going to make a phone call to a specific group of muscles to do a job. In this case, I need muscles that pull in the direction of extension. We're going to get to that later, but I'm trying to give you an example of, of, of thinking of muscles in a different way. So if gravity wants to make my teeter-totter flex, it should make sense that I need to use muscles that pull this way to prevent this from happening. Muscles that pull in the direction of extension can work, do a job, contract, try to shorten. But if I keep my, my cervical from moving, they're not causing motion, but they are preventing motion. So that's why sometimes people get stiff in their in their neck muscles, right? Tension, headaches, and 
and your, your, these muscles back here, your, they call them your erector spinae, but there's several little intrinsic and extrinsic muscles back there. Because if you've been working all day and you've been upright all day, they're tired. They've been doing a job all day, keeping your neck from falling over. Okay, so muscles work to do jobs. Hey buddy, you okay? Kitty cat. So muscles work to do jobs. So what we have to, excuse me, I need to go let the cat out. Come on. Come on. So muscles work to do jobs. So what I'm gonna teach you today is we're gonna be some detectives. We're gonna be some kinesiology detectives and we're gonna look for the kinesiology clues to figure out who do I need to call to do a certain job, okay? What muscles? Think of it like this. Um, when you go to a weight room and you go to an exercise and they'll have like a picture and they'll say uh, muscles targeted. It's just another way of saying, who are you working? And the way you learn or the way you identify, that's a better term. The way you identify who's working is to ask yourself, why are they working? Why are they needed? And if you think about it, that's true in life. Um, if something is on fire, you need to call the fire department. I know that's a simple analogy, but it's very true. You need to know who to call because you need to understand why you need to call them. If there's an emergency, you call 911. If you need a policeman, you call a policeman. If you need a doctor, you need a doctor. If you need a therapist, you call a specific type of therapist. If my foot, something wrong with my foot, I'm gonna call a podiatrist. Same thing with skeletal muscles. We need to know who to call because we understand why we need to call them, okay? So I'm gonna categorize forces right now into two main uh, categories. One, we're gonna have intrinsic forces within our bodies. Uh, and I'm not talking like, uh, you know, I'm talking about influencers of motion, right? So that's gonna leave out the heart that's gonna leave out like inner thecal pressure. That's, there's different types of forces, but specifically this is influencer of motion. So internal or intrinsic uh, influence of your motion is gonna be muscles. Extrinsic forces, influencers of your motion outside of your body, that's gonna be gravity ground reaction forces, so basically the pushes that you're getting from the floor, friction that you're feeling from the floor. Uh, if, you're in a, um, if you're doing a bench press, external force would be like the bar pushing back on your hands because of gravity pulling on the bar. So basically it's everything that's trying to move you outside of your body, okay? so intrinsic or internal forces, those are muscles. External, extrinsic forces, those are things like gravity, friction, pushes, specific things outside of your body. And so if we keep it simple, if we keep it simple, muscles are only reacting or doing a job because of external influences. Okay? You know, it's, uh, it's really that simple. So um, I have an analogy uh, that I have in the book. I, I wanna make sure I have the right page. It's around 62 or so, but it's the tug of war analogy. And what the tug of war analogy is, look, I, I made, I, I went and robbed my little son's uh, little R2D2 lunchbox because I tried to do some props, I'm doing the best I can, guys. So what I have here is, a lunchbox. Now this represents something. It represents uh, uh, something that has uh, that has the force of gravity pulling down on it. Right? Gravity is pulling down. Now I want to preference. Gravity is always pulling what we perceive as down. It's really pulling to the center of planet Earth, right? And we use 
machines and exercise equipment to redirect that pull of gravity. That's why we have like pulleys. So imagine like a, a tricep push down exercise, right? Where gravity is still pulling on those metal plates, but because of pulleys, the pulleys redirect the force. So in other words, uh, if you had a pulley here, that force would be redirected where on one side of the one side of the pulley, gravity is pulling down, but the pulley redirects to try to make your hands go up. Okay. That's one of the functions of, of a pulley or a lever system where it could redirect the force. Neither here nor there. So here we have a a weight, something with stuff in it and gravity wants to move it down. What I have here is I have this little arrow that represents the direction of pull force that this string has and what is needed to do a job, okay? So if I, if I wanna keep, if I wanna take my hand off of the lunchbox and keep it for you guys to see, I need this string to pull up and it's doing a job. Spin around, huh, buddy? Okay. It's doing a job. It's keeping the lunchbox from falling down. Now, what if the job was to, let's say the lunchbox was too low and I needed to raise it up. I needed to influence its motion. I needed to actually move. I'm still gonna be pulling in the same direction and I'm gonna make it come up. That was an analogy of concentric work. Pulling up, bringing it up while pulling up, shortening while trying to shorten. Making it come up, okay? What if it was too high? I held it up here and you couldn't quite see it. Now, remember the string's still pulling up, right? Preventing it from falling down. So in this example, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to let it come down. So the motion is down, but the influence, the force that is controlling that motion of coming down is still up. And that is the trick to eccentrics. Eccentrics is pulling in one direction, but either allowing it to speed up or making it slow down in the other direction. So again, by pulling up, I can allow it to come down. Now, obviously if I snip the string, the little, uh, a little lunchbox would fall down at the speed of which gravity can offer. So not all motion, you want gravity to speed up, right? Like in other words, if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you have a newborn baby, a baby, doesn't have to be a newborn baby, but you don't want gravity to lower that baby into, the, into the, the crib. You don't want gravity to speed it up. You want to do a job, which is to control the speed of going down you are, in essence, making it go slower than what gravity can offer. That's a job. That's a job. Slow and controlled motion. You know, if you had a bucket full of water, right, and you didn't want to spill any, you would control the speed. I'm not going to tell you what's in this glass. If, you, if this glass was filled to the top, and you wanted to lower it down, you would control the speed of which it goes down. Gravity is like, dude, I can make that go down real fast. But you're like, no, gravity, thank you for the offer. But I don't want to spill any. So I need to make sure that the motion is slower than what you can offer. Well, guess who's responsible for making it go slow and controlled? Your muscles. And if gravity is trying to speed it up going down, and I'm trying to make it move slower than that, I need muscles that are pulling up, okay? I need upward pullers letting it go down through eccentric work. 
All right, now let's take this up down example. Right? When I say up down, gravity is trying to do this. My muscles are trying to do that up down example. And let's bring it across, okay? We're gonna bring this example across into the tug of war analogy. So not all forces, external and internal, are up and down. Some of them are across, right? And if you think about it, machines, again, through pulleys, you can get into a fly machine and the influences are in the across, not necessarily the up down, right now. Delirious. So let's use a tug of war analogy. And we, of course, for this analogy, I'm gonna have to define some things and set some parameters here, okay? So if you are playing tug of war and you are playing tug of war with a child, that's important here. The analogy that I'm gonna set up with this tug of war analogy, and that's all in your book, but I'm, I'm gonna try to do a better job of, of enlightening, uh, uh, embellishing it and explaining it for those of you that may not kind of catch on I'm to the book analogy. You represent your musculoskeletal system. You represent the internal intrinsic forces. You represent, because you can control you. So you represent the muscles that are needed that you call to do a job. Remember, calling muscles to do a job is the, the simplest way of explaining innervation because your nerves call. Your nerves are actually communicating that message. Your brain is you. Your nerves are the phone system. And then the muscles do their job. So in the tug-of-war analogy, you're playing tug-of-war with a child. Now, why a child? Because the child represents external forces, which are technically it's true because that child pulling on that rope is external to you. It's internal to them, but it's external to you. It's an external force. It, it could be it could be arbitrary. If that kid's pulling with 20 pounds of force, that could be a, a weight pulling with a pulley of 20 pounds of force. In other words, it doesn't matter who's doing it. You just know that there's a force trying to pull that rope the other way that you pull. So you're playing against a child. And again, why a child? Because that child, we're going to assume, can't pull as much as you can. In other words, you have the potential to create more pull force than the kid. And that's true with most exercises. What, what exercise have you ever gone into a gym and purposefully put more weight than what you can influence? No, you put weight that you know you can move. And so again, that's why I have this scenario set up the way I do. So here's the tug of war string. You have a kid, this is a kid's lunchbox, and the lunchbox is trying to pull this way, trying to bring the rope this way. There's your pull, comes up. You're trying to pull this way. So there's the tug of war. You have two forces. One is external to you, and the other is internal to you. Outside, inside, outside, inside. So let's think of how you can influence motion. Let's pretend that in the middle of this tug of war rope, there is a little flag. Let's see, in the middle of this tug of war rope, nah, I need an extra hand. I could use an extra hand. There's a little flag in the middle, right? Now sometimes tug of wars have flags. So we're gonna have to imagine there's a little flag. Because you pull more than the kid, you are in a position of power. You control all of the motion that's gonna go on in this tug of war. If you think about it, if you're playing a kid in tug of war, Maybe this is you, but it shouldn't be if you're trying to entertain them. You know, maybe you're babysitting uh, during the, this break. Probably what's not going to happen is ready, set, go, and you 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 uh show your dominance and you sling them across the yard, right? And you're like, yeah, now what, kid? 
Where you at? Who's your daddy? No. If you're a, if you're a good babysitter who wants to get hired again, you're probably going to do something like this. Now, you have to imagine, I set up the tug of war like this, but I'm going to pretend to be the puller. I'm going to pretend to be you, the muscles. All right, you ready, little Johnny? You ready, Sally? Okay, ready, go. And you're going to you're going to pretend you could pull with more force, but you're not. You're going to choose. You're going to make that call to those muscles. Remember, the more stimulus, the more electricity, the, the, the bigger you, the more you innervate, the more pull force. So you're not going to innervate max. You're going to innervate sub max. You're going to match. If you're playing tug of war with a kid and you're trying to literally play with them, you're going to see how hard they're pulling and then you're going to match it. You're going to pull with their force. You're going to choose to select a tone, an innervation above resting tone that's going to match them because you're going to tie them for a little while. In other words, make them feel that they're, that they're, 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 they're work, they're, they're battling you. They're, they're with you. So you're going to be like, now, your muscles are recruiting above resting tone. They are, in fact, contracting. And those muscles are doing a job. If you think about it, they are doing a job. Because if they wouldn't pull, even though they're pulling some max, they're doing a job because if they didn't pull with at least that amount of force, the rope would start moving away from you. In this case, the external force, we're gonna get into motions in a little bit, but the external force, the force outside of you is trying to bring your hands away from your body. If we look at it from joint motions, the external force, I'm just gonna look at shoulders and elbows here, but the external force is trying to extend your elbows, right? So if the external force in this example is trying to extend your elbows, I need a group of muscles to do a job to prevent my elbows from extending. Shouldn't that make sense? Well, who could I call to prevent my elbows from extending? I don't want to call my extensors because my extensor muscles would actually pull in that direction. They would, they would, they would help. If I called my tricep and my inconius, my other elbow extensors, they would be like, hey, I want to be on their team. <laughs> right? That's not how it happens. If you're playing this tug of war game and you're actually pulling in your direction, you would need muscles like the bicep and the brachialis and the brachioradialis. We call those elbow flexors, not because they necessarily cause flexion, but because they pull that way. So if you think about it, if you have something that's trying to extend you and you don't want that to happen, you want to keep your elbow, in this case, a flex position, you need to recruit muscles that pull in the direction of flexion to prevent extension. Just like I need to recruit muscles that pull up sometimes to prevent something from falling down, I would need to recruit flexors to prevent extension. That's going to be Monday's lecture. But back to the tug of war analogy. You are in a unique position with this kid that you're playing tug of war with because you can influence motion by using those flexors, by using your bicep in this case, in three ways. Your elbow flexors, with the bicep being one of them, is stronger than theirs. So you're in a position of power. You are an influence. You are the limiting factor of motion. That's what I mean. Tug of war. Ready, set, go. You choose to have no motion. You choose to tie. That's isometric work. Isometric contraction. Your muscles are still trying to shorten, but there's no change in length while they are doing their job of keeping that rope from going anywhere. It's still you. 
that's responsible for that. Because again, if you let loose, if you let, let off of your muscles, whew, motion is going to happen. So it's still those muscles that are ultimately responsible for preventing that motion. All right, so what's going to happen? You're going to pull for a little while, then all of a sudden, maybe you're going to let them get their confidence up. Because again, if you want to get that babysitting job, you kind of have to let them win every now and then. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, I'm going to choose to let them start to win. Now let's think about that for a second. Let's go back to our teeter-totter. If a teeter-totter has two forces trying to rotate it, and no motion is happening, then it makes sense. I have to have just as much force on one side as the other. Those forces have to be balanced. If I get any kind of motion speed up in either way, that means one of these forces has to be greater than the other. So what happens is, is that if you start letting that child win, your muscles are gonna say, okay guys, here's the plan. On the count of three, we are going to choose to pull a little bit less than what we were pulling at isometrics. Just a little less. Not a lot, just a little less. Ready? One, two, three. You lessen the innervation. You lessen the stimulus. You lessen the magnitude of that phone call. It's not that you're not calling them. You're lessening the magnitude of the call. You're lessening the innervation. You're lessening the stimulus. The, your muscles are going to start to pull less than what they were. If the kid is still pulling with the same amount of force, right? When you start to pull less, then that creates an imbalance. Then all of a sudden, the child is pulling more on the rope than you are. But it's not because they all of a sudden pulled more. It's that you chose to pull less. And when that happens, your hands will start to move away from you. Well, if my hands move away from me, that's elbow extension. But yet I'm still using the same muscles. I'm still using my bicep. This is important. Bicep and the other elbow flexors are still doing their job. Because if you think about it, if even if you're extending the elbow in this case, even if the kid is extending your elbow. If all of a sudden those flexors shut off, that extension would happen a lot faster. Just like in this example, it would fall a lot faster if I didn't have a muscle pulling up. So keep in mind, even though you're losing, you are choosing to lose. It's on your terms. And you're still doing a job because you are controlling the speed at which you lose. You are determining how fast I'm going to let my hands move away from me. You are still in control. That's eccentric example analogy. Being lengthened, yet still trying to shorten. Not at max. I'm not saying you got to try to shorten max. It's rare. Trying to shorten submax is more common. A lot more common. Being lengthened while still trying to shorten. I still need my flexors. I still need my bicep. And I need my biceps to control the speed of loss. To control the speed of movement away from their pull. Now, you're not going to let that kid win. you just giving them a little false sense of hope. You're going to be like... going to bring it back. Right? You know you would. So let's talk about what's happening there. All of a sudden, my same muscles, remember my same muscles have been working this whole time. My bicep and my elbow flexors are going to slow down that extension and then say, get over here. And they are going to cause the flexion. They're going to be responsible for that elbow flexion. And remember, when I have elbow flexion, I start to win. I bring the flag to me. Shortening while trying to shorten above resting tone. That's concentric work. 
So the tug of war analogy where you represent your muscles, the kid represents the external force, man. You can see all three scenarios from the perspective of, of a muscle like your bicep. Tying while trying to shorten. Um, again, imagine if you're tying the kid, right? And you're like pretending and there's no motion and then the kid let go. What would happen? You'd shorten. Because even in isometrics, in that tug of war analogy, you're trying to shorten. Okay? So in the tug of war, we have all three scenarios of work, of doing the job. <clears throat> no length while trying to shorten, isometric. Being lengthened while trying to shorten, eccentric. Shortening while trying to shorten, concentric. The tug of war analogy is meant to serve as how most motion happens, slow and controlled, slow and controlled motion. That's not to say that you can't have fast change in direction and fast motion. It's just that that's rare. You know, you think of Usain Bolt, the fastest man that's ever walked this earth, and he's a sprinter. This is what he does for a living. How often do you think he's moving as fast as he can in terms of his activities of daily living? Rare. Guys, most of our motions are slow and controlled where groups of muscles are making you speed up, letting you go down, slow and controlled motion. So a majority of our analogies, and you think about any weight room you go into, man, slow and controlled motion, it has the tug of war analogy in it where the machine is an external force that represents a child's influence on that rope. In other words, you can beat it. You set the weight. It, 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 you wouldn't set a weight that you couldn't move because then you wouldn't even do one repetition. You're going to set the weight sub-max so that your muscles can be greater in this tug of war. And then let's say, for example, I'm doing um, a, a shoulder press, okay? One arm shoulder press so that I could keep this now. I get into the machine. I make it go up. That's work. You're doing a job, concentric work, making it go up. If I want to hold it here for a second, I am making it stay up. Because if I turned off all my muscles, you fall down. So the same muscles that made me go up in this tug of war are still pulling above resting tone to keep me up. And then the trick is the same muscles that made me go up and the same muscles that are keeping me up let me go down eccentric work because once again if i use muscles that pulled down i'd have gravity and muscles imagine having a tug of war where the little kid and you were pulling on the same side of the rope you'd make the rope fly across the room it's the same concept imagine having gravity wanting your shoulder to extend and then all of a sudden you recruited muscles that pull down. You'd have two forces pulling on one end of the tug war rope with nothing on the side. You'd make it go fast. That doesn't sound very safe, right? So in exercises and activities of daily living, the trick is, and I'm going to piggyback this on the next lecture, identify why those muscles need to work. And you know why those muscles need to work because you're going to be able to figure out what motion, external forces such as the ground, gravity, weights, machines, what motions are they trying to cause? What motions are they trying to do? How are they trying to move me? In other words, if you understand that the kid wants to pull you this way on the rope, then you need to pull that way on the rope. If the kid wants to do this, you need to do this. If the kid wants to do that, you need to do this. If the force is trying to extend me, let's say I have a dumbbell. If the external force is trying to extend me, I need to recruit flexors. I need to recruit my bicep to play tug of war against it. And this muscle can make me go up keep me up or let me go down while still pulling all in the same direction. If the external force is trying to flex me, I need tricep to make me go up, keep me up, let me go down, okay? 
So the so what for today's lecture is identifying external influences. What is the external force trying to do to you? And if we can identify what the external force is trying to do to us, then we can logically deduce what internal forces are needed to play tug of war with that external force to influence motion. Okay, so we're going to piggyback that on the next lecture. If you want to read ahead, that's kind of like uh, identify external forces. We're going to get into muscle groups. And I have some more analogies for you guys. I'm trying to keep the lectures between 30 and 40 minutes because I know that it's hard uh, to pay attention uh, in this kind of setting. And I can't kind of run around and do silly things. So uh, stay up on the lectures, guys. And uh, if you have any questions, you know what to do. Later.